Hi, welcome to Hillcrest Chapel Video. We hope today's message will help you grow. For all the moms, all kinds of motherhood that is in the room, we recognize that taking a moment to celebrate and thank moms is a complicated matter because how God reveals motherhood in his creation is complicated and not in all the ways that we always imagine it. But we thank God that his attributes of care are shown in motherhood. The Bible says male and female he created them and together did they show his attributes. So this morning, as we begin to pray, I just want to say that parenthood and motherhood is complicated business with good and poor examples, losses, and unfulfilled hopes. So this morning, with the help of a young lady named Amy Young, I want to attempt a prayer to honor it all. So if you're with a mom or a mom figure, and you want to hold their hand real quick, or you want to hold somebody in your heart and mind, would you join me in this prayer? And all the squeaks and wiggles of kids are the joy sound of our church. Join me in this prayer. Lord, we thank you for the revelation of yourself and the love that is displayed in motherhood. We thank you for all the ways that you have embedded into your creation motherhood. And we thank you for all the moms of all sorts gathered into this room this morning. In loving them, we express our love to you. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who have experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or runaway, we grieve with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you and thank you. To those who have a warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their moms this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day, may God redeem. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that children has not yet turned out the way you long for it. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not yet to be, we are with you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who have placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both unexpected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you, we honor you, we thank you, and we lift you up in prayer today. Amen and amen. Who's been on um, UCM staff for 15 years? Uh, And Jessica, as somebody, Jessica's in our small group, and I've gotten to know you, and you live this out faithfully in your real life. And so thank you. We're honored to hear you share with us today. Thanks, Tim. Good morning. morning. Happy Mother's Day. Um, Like Tim said, I'm Jessica, and my husband and I have been on this uh, college ministry staff team for many years, and um, we're especially excited this morning to welcome the Sikkim students. It's not very loud right now because they're not in this room, but if you come to second service, it will be very loud. There's 150 of them. They're going to join us at the end of the service. Um, to get prayed for and commissioned for the week. It's Student Institute of Campus Ministry, where they they basically just stay with us for a week, and they learn how to be missionaries back home on their campuses at home. So it's an awesome week. Um, And many of you are are housing them, any Sikkim host families, on Mother's Day, hosting Sikkim students. Thank you. We couldn't do that without you. 
And I think it's perfect that they're with us today and for this week because, like Tim said, it's, um, it's Missions Month here at Hillcrest. And this morning, I get the pleasure of um, helping us understand and celebrate college ministry in particular. Um, we get to celebrate what God is doing on the three campuses in our backyard, Western Washington University, uh, Skagit Valley uh, College to the south, and Whatcom Community College to the north through the ministry of Campus Christian Fellowship. And actually, this year, CCF celebrates 45 years up at Western, so it's a pretty special year. Now, it also happens to be Mother's Day today, if you didn't notice. Um, So it's a big morning, right? So these, these three things are colliding. Three things that I love dearly are colliding all on the same day. Sikkim, college ministry, and motherhood. So it's going to be a really fun morning for me. And if you're a mom here this morning um, and you think a sermon on college ministry may not apply to you, just wait because it totally does, okay? And if you think a sermon on missions means that you'll have to add even more to your full plate as a mom, just wait because it totally doesn't. Um, What I want to do, it's a unique morning, and what I want to do with this cocktail of things that we're celebrating and recognizing, I want to share with you one um, sort of principle that I learned in college ministry that transfers across whatever season that we find ourselves in, okay? And that principle is this, your mission is where your feet are. Your mission is where your feet are. In a little while, we're going to look at where this idea came from because it's not from me. Um, But first, I want to tell you about when my feet first arrived on Western's campus. 20 years ago this month, May 1998, my feet first hit Western's campus. Um, I was a senior in high school, and I took this tour of Western's campus, right, to check it out. And it was by far like the worst possible tour any student has ever taken in the history of studentdom. First of all, it was pouring down rain, which, rude, Western. But, you know, what else is new? Um, But then I get hit, like an hour into the tour, I get hit with a stomach flu. And I basically spent the day (laughs) touring like six of the bathrooms on campus. And that was it, right? And then... The people I was with, they, like, leave me on this bench in the Viking Union to just, like, rest while they finish the tour. They drape me in this raincoat and just leave me there. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, this random guy walked up to me, and he goes, Hey, man, you can't just sleep wherever you want to on campus. You need to leave. (laughs) Like, welcome to Western. This was my inauguration into what's supposed to be the best years of my life. Now, Western's a great place. They just had a bad day, in case you're applying there, okay? But I still, like, distinctly remember laying on this bench thinking to myself, can anything good come from this God-forsaken place? (laughs) And the answer is yes, but we'll get there, okay? I didn't want to go to Western. And there was more to it than this terrible day that I had, okay? If you'd asked me back then what I wanted to be someday, as a senior in high school, I would have told you I want to be a missionary. Not like the door-to-door type of missionary, because that was weird, but the kind of missionary who, like, makes friends with people, right? Who, Who shares their Jesus story, who helps people find their Jesus story, too. Like, that kind of missionary, And the idea of doing this overseas was intriguing to me. I was that girl in youth group who went on like every possible mission trip imaginable, like everything they offered, I was going on those mission trips. I was like a serial mission tripper. I I had, you know, I I started learning Spanish religiously, and I had these like horrible crushes on missionary kids (laughs) and always secretly hoped I would marry a missionary kid which is funny because I married a pretty cute one sitting right there. So check that off the list. But if you would have pressed me a little bit, if you would have pressed me and said, but what does it take to become a missionary? I would have told you in all my youthful wisdom that it means you have to go to Bible college and then you immediately go overseas. 
See, I assumed that unless I went to seminary and became like a world career missionary, capital M, that I couldn't be on mission for Jesus. And so I didn't want to go to Western, right, a public university where I'd never find Christian community, where I'd never get a biblical education, where I'd never interact with the nations. You can hear the fatalist Jessica right now, which is a part of me I'm not proud of. But I did not want to go to Western. I was, like, not having it. But, and, I, and I want to pause here for just a minute because... Um, obviously going to seminary and leaving the country is a fantastic way to do missions. So I'm not knocking that. What I am knocking, though, is this idea that that's the only way to be a missionary. We're going to hear from a global missionary next week. And to that route for missions, I say amen and hallelujah. But back then, I had a reductionist view of missions. Okay, I had reduced missions to being out there somewhere, um, far away, but not right here. I'd reduced missions to being, you know, someday later on after I was prepared, but not right now. Okay, but thankfully, um, we have a God who's patient with our reductionisms and who pursues us anyway. I did end up coming to Western, uh, obviously, <laughs> for, the, to, for the very spiritual and profound reason that it was way cheaper than Bible college. <laughs> um, all the parents say amen. <laughs> um, and I would, I would say that as I pulled up on move-in weekend that I was like proactively grumpy about this. Um, but as I got out of my parents' minivan, before I even set foot in my residence hall, a CCF student named Laura She greeted me, she helped me move my stuff in, and she invited me into community right then and there. It was my first encounter with a campus missionary. And little did I know when I pulled up to that curb that 25 years before that, that the Lord had won the heart of a young Brady Bobbink who had called him to keep his feet planted there, and he had given him a vision, this picture of Western, I think you have it, this, this vision he, he had of Western all lit up as a city on a hill, as a place to reach and train and send out students as missionaries, globally and locally. See, for 45 years, friends, uh, Western has been a fruitful sending ground, not in spite of it being a public university, but precisely because it's a public university. And little did I know that day that that a solid biblical education would be possible through CCF classes, through Friday nights, through the internship program, and through uh, personal mentorship one-on-one throughout the week. And there were even mission trips I could take. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) And not just, you know, not just mission trips, but in CCF I learned to be missional. Okay? We learned to be on mission not just by looking out there and looking far away into our futures, but we learned to be on mission by doing this, by looking down at our feet, at the ground that we were walking on, and looking around at the feet walking around next to us, looking up at those faces and praying for them. And, and, and there were these unexpected life-on-life moments everywhere you looked on campus, in the residence halls, in the dining halls, in the lounges, in our classrooms. And, and, and as students, the Spirit would, would empower us and would enable us in these very ordinary daily places on campus right where our feet were. Ordinary places that became sacred places because the Holy Spirit showed up and used us there. Because it's in those ordinary places that missions happen. And speaking of reaching the nations, uh, mind blown, you can reach out to international students. <laughs> Did you know that our country hosts about 1.2 million international students on American campuses every year? 1.2 million. It's a picture of a uh, few of our international students in our ministry um, up at Western. And you know, when I was a student, I was able to live with students from about five different countries. 
And I was blown away by their hunger for friendship and their openness to the things of God. And then the tremendous impact they had as leaders when they would return home to their home cultures. And, you know, some of you at Hillcrest, uh, you're helping international students meet Jesus by cooking food for them. Has anybody cooked a meal for talk time? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. If you feed them, they will come. And actually, we need more cooks. So if you like to cook and you want to help international students meet Jesus, talk to Renata DeCoster after, and you can help sign up. Um, some of you, I know some of you have even adopted a core group or adopted students and welcomed them into the, your home to give them a home away from home. Thank you. You and we, as a church, we're investing in some of the most influential culture shapers on the planet. People who graduate and then they start things like Skookum Kids. Okay? It's why I became a campus pastor, and it's why this church invests so deeply in college missions. Amen? Just out of curiosity, how many of you are uh, CCF alumni from Whatcom or Western or Skagit? Awesome. You can see the impact of college missions in our midst. And it's, it, you know, it's in our blood. Did, did you know that every month, uh, over half of the missionaries that our church supports are campus missionaries? That's almost 50 missionaries. And, and more are waiting for us, waiting to be sent by us, and, and waiting to be sent not just in our region, but across the country and across the world, starting here in Bellingham. So thank you, church, for enabling college ministry. I don't know if you've been around Hillcrest very long, but pretty soon you'll notice that it, at the root of our DNA here is this principle that, that the people in our backyard up the hill are our primary mission. Okay, that our mission must start where our feet already are and expand from there. So in CCF, you know, Jesus sort of radically redefined my missiology. And then I graduated, and everything changed. <laughs> but with every place that my, that my feet have taken me since then, from college to, to college ministry to motherhood to this hybrid of both, to moving houses to my kids now being in school, I've had to reorient to the mission of Jesus in whatever my new context is. And, I, you know, I don't know what your context is, whether it's been the same as it's been for a long time or whether you're in transition, but what I want to stop and ask you is this. Where have your feet been taking you lately? And do you see yourself as a missionary there? That shouldn't be an easy question to answer. So take time this month, Missions Month, to think on that with Jesus. I want us to look at who came, with this, uh, came up with this idea that your mission is where your feet are. Um, we're going to read the Great Commission text in Matthew. It's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. If you want to turn with me there or you can follow along on the screen. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And as we read... Um, Pay special attention to the word go. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always. And by this he means his spirit. Um, to the very end of the age. This is what's called the Great Commission. And it's a nickname. Um, but it's a fitting nickname for this statement of Jesus's because it's his final instructions. It's, it's his final commissioning to his disciples before he ascends into heaven and then leaves his spirit to empower them. And I love this because it, if you read it, it really is a co-mission right? It's not just a go and do this and good luck kind of mission, but it's an I will give you my spirit and we'll do this with you and we'll do this through you kind of mission. Much better kind of mission. <laughs> 
But I want us to specially look at this word go. Go and make disciples. It's a really interesting word, actually. The word go typically gets all the press. It typically gets all the attention in the Great Commission, right? And when you pair it with the words um, every nation, we usually assume that it's primarily talking about spreading the gospel to foreign countries. That makes sense. And yes, Jesus is a, uh, has made that our mission on earth. Jesus has been clear about that. The whole of scripture has been clear about that being our big picture mission. But I'm going to get all linguistical with you for a minute, okay? The original Greek verb go here, it can mean two things. And Matthew, the, the gospel writer, he uses it both ways throughout his gospel. Meaning number one, it can mean, probably what you're thinking in your head, it can mean stop what you're doing, full stop, pick up, and move from one place to the other, okay? But it can also mean as you are going, an ongoing sense to it. I call the first one big G go, (laughs) and the second one little g go. While you are going about your daily life, be making disciples, And keep, follow me here. If you look at the Great Commission in Greek, which, talk to Tim or Christian, if you really want to dig deep in that. Um, If you look at the Greek, the dominant verb in the Great Commission is not go. The dominant verb is actually make disciples. But when you smash these two verbs together, like we're doing some verb smashing here, go and make, when you smash the two verbs together, the go takes on the little g form. The go takes on the as-you-are-going form. So yes, Jesus uses both forms of go all over the Gospels, but in the Great Commission, what he's saying is this. As you are going, be making disciples. Does that make sense? A New Testament professor from Denver Seminary, I think he says it really well, and I thought this was helpful. He says this. Too little is made of it when all attention is centered on the command to go so that foreign missions are elevated to a higher status of Christian service than other forms of spiritual activity. To make disciples of all nations does require many people to leave their homelands. But Jesus' main focus remains on the task of all believers to duplicate themselves wherever they may be. And friends, my point is this. When we overemphasize one go over the other go, we reduce the Great Commission. When we overemphasize one go over the other go, we reduce the Great Commission. So if we're supporting world missionaries, but we're avoiding our loud neighbors next door, we are reducing the Great Commission. And conversely, if we love our neighbors really, really well, but we get upset when our own kids are called into foreign missions and move away from us, we reduce the Great Commission. And if you read the Gospels, friends, you're going to see how Jesus like, beautifully holds these two goes in tension. Right? He asks some of his followers to literally drop their nets, to walk after him, and to go to other towns and eventually other countries right? Big G go, world missions, and we need to be ready if he asks us to do that. But have you also noticed that that when Jesus would heal people, that he often told them to turn and tell the people in their immediate orbit what God had done for them, to, to go home, and as they were going about their lives, to tell their story. And and hear this, if you're not feeling particularly mature enough to be a missionary this morning, Jesus never waited until people were mature to send them out as missionaries. Okay, the second they experienced him, they were qualified to go and tell others. So welcome. Welcome. Time and time again. You know, if you read the Gospels with this lens, it's fascinating. Jesus makes his plan to go somewhere on mission. He has like a big G, big go, purpose and mission, but he's constantly interrupted by ordinary people that are physically right in front of him. Okay, loud neighbors, (laughs) right? 
He's on his way to Jerusalem. We studied this in the book of Mark. Most of the book of Mark is this path that he's on, this road that he's on, on mission to Jerusalem, on the way. But over and over again, people annoyingly interrupt his progress. They run up to him. They, they, they grab his robe while he's en route somewhere else, right? And he doesn't see these as bothersome interruptions to his mission. He sees these as his mission. Jesus' mission was where his feet were, and he was making disciples as he was going. And we are invited to do the same. Parents, I want to talk to you directly for a minute. Who are the people closest to your feet? Like literally stepping on your feet, maybe even right now. Our children, right? And parents, if you know and follow Jesus, you are missionaries. I don't know if you've seen yourself that way, but, but our children, they're not an interruption to our mission. Raising them is not just a, a pause until we can get back to the real mission. They are not just a vehicle for our mission. As we are going, our children are our mission. And moms, this Mother's Day, God bless you for reaching your own kids. Jesus, I want to just say this, Jesus sees you and considers your mothering incredibly valuable and, yes, even missional. And I felt prompted to speak specifically to new moms. And I think there's a lot of them. There's a lot of baby dedications this morning. New moms... I want to speak to you. If your life feels full of diapers and sleep deprivation and showerlessness, anybody? Maybe it was just me. And maybe, you know, maybe you walked around the ministry fair last week at all the tables with this glazed look in your eye, like overwhelmed at the idea of like, signing up for a ministry because, duh, you just birthed a tiny human recently and they're taking over your life. You're like, someone please sign up for my ministry called Motherhood and come help me out, please. <laughs> like, we should start that. <laughs> Five years into full-time campus ministry, I made the transition that you're in, the transition to motherhood. And do you know what I found myself doing when I was changing diapers and sleep-deprived and so showerless? <laughs> okay, I found myself reducing missions again. That, that, that it was somewhere... It was more exciting up on campus, but not right here. That, that, that someday down the road, when I was done being a young mom, then I could like, get back to it. And once again, because he's gracious and kind, the Lord spoke into my reductionism again. And this was his word to me, and I believe to you as well. It's precisely the ordinary, daily underestimated places where our feet go that have tremendous missional potential. That, that this is part of Jesus' strategy. It, it's part of how the kingdom spreads, slowly sometimes. Over time, through, through, through people like young moms, you know, inch by inch, footstep by footstep, in ordinary places, in ordinary places that become sacred places because the Holy Spirit decides to move and to move through us even when we have very little to give. Right after we had our first baby, Owen, I was praying and kind of wrestling with what mission, what in the world mission was supposed to look like for me now. Um, and the Lord, with a little help from my Hillcrest small group, um, gave me this idea. Uh, my feet had recently taken me somewhere meaningful, a childbirth class. And I already wanted new mom friends. So what if I invited all these new moms over to our tiny little apartment uh, for a play date? I just thought maybe I'd give it a try. And I wasn't sure if anyone would respond or if they'd even need that or want that. But the first, the first play date, eight moms showed up, and they're eight babies, and they stayed five hours. Like, I wasn't prepared for this. 
Yeah, there they are. This is what we did to our babies. Uh, Halloween one year. Owen is the pumpkin on the right, and he's actually still friends with the pumpkin on the left. It's kind of cool. And, you know, as we were chugging coffee and eating so much banana bread, um, we started doing this every week. And we did this for years. This group continued for years. And, and these moms, they were hungry for friendship. And, and slowly, emphasis on slowly, um, slowly they became hungry to talk about God and to ask questions and to share their story and to hear my story. And over time, an ordinary place, a living room, a red couch, <laughs> became a sacred place because the Holy Spirit chose to move. So, so, so even as new moms, even if our feet don't take us very far anymore, we can join Jesus Okay, we can piggyback on the things we're already doing where our feet are already going to join Jesus there. Amen? Amen. Many of you know um, David and Shelley Nebel, good friends of ours. Um, they, I asked them if I could share their story because I think it's really meaningful um, to share their story kind of as we close this morning. Um, for about 20 years now, Shelly's feet have taken her into the public schools to come alongside her children. She's like my mentor in how to be a public school mom, right? She's done this for years, and a couple years ago, um, she became a mentor to a teen mom. And uh, pretty soon, this teen mom had her baby girl, and not long after, this baby girl got dropped off on the Nebel's porch because she needed a safe home. Alma Luna. And not long after that, um, about a year later, another baby girl got dropped off on the Nebel's porch because she needed a safe home, Alma Luna's baby sister, Estrella. It's a picture of them with David. Many of you know them and enjoy them in this community. Um, David and Shelley are like on the brink of becoming empty nesters, <laughs> okay? The end the end is in sight for them, the, the American cultural norm at their fingertips. And if anybody has put in their time, they have put in their time, right? Yeah. But, but th this is what Shelley told David when they were presented with this opportunity. This is what she said. I thought this was profound. She said, if we were overseas missionaries right now and we were asked to do this, we would say yes. So, so why wouldn't we hear why wouldn't we now? Whew, just gonna sit with that for a minute. Because, because their mission is where their feet are, not out there somewhere else, but right here. Because they're relying on the Spirit's power to do something quite countercultural. Because of these things, they have two beautiful girls whose lives are being forever changed in their home, in this community. So thank them if you see them. They'll be here next service. And to all foster and adoptive parents, I just want to say thank you for putting your faith where your feet are. Worship team, if you would um, come up as we respond. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was like, I will be leading us in worship apparently. <laughs> Where have your feet been taking you lately, friends? Your feet don't look like my feet. They don't look like Shelly Nebel's feet, okay? Your mission field is where your feet are, not someone else's. And your feet is exactly where the Spirit wants to move, your orbit, your context. The greatest platform for missions is our lives right where they are today. And do you see yourself as a missionary in those places? It shouldn't be an easy answer, okay? Sit on that, chew on that this month. Do you see yourself as a missionary in those places, ordinary places that become sacred places because the Holy Spirit moves? And as you are going, are you relying on the power of his Spirit to enable you? 
And it's in that posture um, that we're going to respond in worship. So I invite us to ask the Spirit just to speak to us, to empower us. And let's just sing these words as a prayer to God, um, wherever our feet find us right now. Thanks for connecting with Hillcrest Chapel. For more info on this and other sermons, go online to hillcrestchapel.com or visit us at 1400 Larrabee Ave in Bellingham, Washington any Sunday morning, 9 or 11 a.m.